Nanotechnology, as you probably know, is the science of the very, very small. And just to give you a feel, one nanometer is to one meter, which is about the size of a yard, as one blueberry width is to the diameter of the Earth. Okay, so this is a billion blueberries side by side will be the Earth. So we're talking incredibly tiny. Now, we use technology, nanotechnology, to both probe life at that size scale, at the size scale where we're built, and then as you'll see, at the Wyss Institute, we're trying to uncover the design principles that nature uses to build, control, and manufacture, and then use them as new engineering principles to make devices to transform medicine and the environment and to just make the world a better place to live. So I've been interested for many, many years in the simple question of how living cells and tissues are constructed. Does anybody know what this is at the bottom right? It's the tip of the tongue, just a high magnification. So most people think of cells this way. They know that it has, they have a membrane. Some people know they have a, a cytoplasm, and in the center, the nucleus, where the DNA is that encodes all our genes. But most people tend to think of the cell as sort of a flexible membrane surrounded by a gooey cytoplasm, or like a water balloon filled with molasses. How many people here think that cells are gooey little balls? Yes, at least there's one back there. <laughs> but it's hard to explain how cells do what they do in our bodies if they were built that way. For example, I'm going to show you how the embryo forms. On the right is a picture of a zebrafish. Some of you kids may have these little fish at home. And this is the yolk sac, sort of the yellow of the egg, if you like. And on top, there are two little balls. That was the egg just divided into two. And now you're going to see they divide into four, and then eight, and then 16, and 32, and 64, and 128, and so on. They get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then they hit a point where they start pulling on each other and twisting and torquing and essentially sculpting the, all the body, organs of the body. That's the, the, the eye and the brain and the spinal cord. And that's how you get an embryo. That's 24 hours. That's overnight. Now, it's very hard to see how cells could do that if they were just water balloons filled with molasses. Furthermore, if you take cells and you put them on a, on a dish, a culture dish, in the body they could be round or take on different shapes. When you put them on a dish, they spread out and they pull themselves out and they flatten. And if you look at them from the side, they're actually attached to a substrate. In the body, it's called extracellular matrix. It's basically the body's parallel of a culture dish. But if you put the cells on a flexible substrate, you could think of like paint film drying on top of paint that's very thin and flexible. You could see cells apply tension. They contract it. So when a cell is flat here, it's, it actually has tension in it. It's like a bow and a bowstring. You can't see the forces, but they're there. So cells are very strong, and they create tension just like your muscle cells. But every cell does this in the body. And that pulling actually pulls the cell out against the, the anchoring substrate and changes its shape. And what's important is that shape controls function of cells in your body. Most people don't know this. And years ago, we used nanotechnology to discover this. And the idea was we wanted to see whether if you had cells in different degrees of stretching, whether they'd act differently. And we did this by using nanotechnology to make little islands coated by, by adhesion molecules that would resist the cell pulling, surrounded by non-adhesive regions you can think of like Teflon. So the cell would stick. It spreads by pulling itself flatter and flatter, and it would hit the non-adhesive part, and it would just, no resistance, it would stop. So on a big circle, we should get a pancake. A little circle, we should get a cupcake. And on a tiny one, we should get a golf ball and a tea. And then this nanotechnology takes techniques that people use to make microchips for the computer industry, where they make very little patterns on a micro scale by using lasers to etch silicon chips in patterns. And what we do is, if we want to make little circular islands the size of single cells, we make little circular holes in a very rigid metal chip. And then we pour a polymer on, here in blue, that forms rubber-like material. And when you peel it off, you literally have a rubber stamp. But the surface topography is the same as you engineered, and it's down to the nanometer scale. And then we stamp that in an ink, just like when you put stamps on a piece of paper. But this ink 
goes through a process called self-assembly. And what we do is we stamp circles of these molecules that allow cells to stick and pull, and we surround them with the same molecules that make a completely flat substrate, but they have little chemical groups that prevent the cells from sticking. When you put cells on these, these are human cells from, from the blood vessels, your capillary blood vessels. And now what we found is that as cells get bigger and bigger and bigger, they stretch more. The growth, meaning the division, the doubling, like I showed in the, in the animation in the beginning, grows, goes higher and higher just by how much they spread. And then if you prevent spreading, they go through what's called a cellular suicide program. They actually die. Now this sounds crazy. Why would you have cells die? But when the, when the, the embryo forms, a baby forms a hand, there's a stage where there's actually webbing. And then at a specific point, the cells in the in-between go under suicide, and that's how you're left with fingers. That's why some babies have abnormalities. They're left with webs. So your body uses this. We then use this nanotechnology technique to make lines instead of circles to hold cells in this in-between region where they neither grow nor die. And these are capillary blood vessel cells. And now we can engineer little capillary blood vessels in a period of hours. So this is like called tissue engineering. Now, its shape is also important in your body. And I think a simple example is wound healing. So this is a diagram of cells sitting on that substrate or in the body, this matrix. And they sit very closely packed. They're tightly squished in. And to think of them sitting on this matrix, the best way I can explain it is to think of eggs sitting on an egg carton with each egg being a cell and this egg carton being this matrix. Now, what happens in your body in the case of an injury? What happens under the Band-Aid? Well, first of all, there's cells that are injured. Your body has a way of clearing them out. If you have a small injury and you still have egg carton, what happens is the cells, the eggs at the edge, are no longer squished and they can stretch. And they stretch by binding that egg carton and pulling themselves, just like before. And that makes them grow. And so what happens is they stretch and grow and stretch and grow and stretch and grow and stretch and grow, and that's wound healing. That's literally how you, you heal a wound. Now, if you have a deeper wound, you actually can lose the egg carton. And what happens is your body gets a little blood clot, and the cells now can move over that blood clot. It's a nonspecific connection. And the way cells move is they deposit a little egg carton and then pull against it. And so it, it recapitulates, reconnects it, but you lose the pattern, and that is scar formation. It's no more complex than that. So if the shape and the forces in cells are important, how are cells constructed at the nanometer scale? And if the old view is that cells are like gooey water balloons, what I proposed many years ago is that cells are built more like tents. If you want to put up a tent, you want to take a membrane and, and basically make it stiff in a certain shape. And the way you do that is you put poles up, and you hit tent pegs in the ground, and you winch it in, you put it under tension. And this was not such a crazy idea because cells, actually we've known for many years, have an internal molecular framework called the cytoskeleton, the cell skeleton. It's made up of molecular scale, nanometer scale, molecular ropes, cables, and, and struts. And they're actually, we know what they are, we know their size, they're seven nanometers, that's billionth of a meter. Uh, filaments called microfilaments. These are actin and they also could have myosin, which is the same filaments that generate tension in muscle. There are bigger ones called microtubules that are hollow tubes that are 25. And then there are intermediate filaments that go throughout the cell that are in between. What I suggested though is that cells here use a very particular form of architecture to, to stabilize themselves that comes out of the Buckminster world, Fuller world of geodesic architecture. Geodesic means minimum path. From dot to dot, it's always taking a linear path. Some of you may have actually played on these. These are often playground structures. There's a sculptor named Kenneth Nelson who built these structures where it's not just all sticks, it's sticks and strings. And they're actually geodesic domes seen in living cells in the skeleton, just like this. And this building system is called tensegrity. It's coined from tensional and integrity. So most man-made buildings, this building uses compressional integrity to hold itself up. It uses brick atop brick. Gravity compresses, squishes down one on top of the other. It's like Stonehenge or an arch. It's stable, but if you hit it from the side, it'll fall over like dominoes. Nature tends to use tension like a spider web. 
And that's embodied in this little toy, which some of you may even have played with as a baby. They're called squish toys sometimes. This has wood sticks that are resist compression. They resist being shortened. They don't touch. They're held up by a continuous series of red elastic strings that want to pull to the center. And if it didn't have the sticks, it would just be this pile of string that would have no shape stability. But because the sticks resist the pull, and the pull compress the sticks, it puts it in a state of isometric tension. It's like a bow and a bowstring. And now it holds itself in a round shape. I su suggested that cells are built this way, because like cells, when they're not anchored, they're round. If I were to put this on a, a dish or a matrix, and I hope you could see in the back, I anchor it, it spontaneously flattens. And if I were to let it go, it bounces up in the air. And when you have cells on a dish and they spread, and now you want to move them from one to the other, you have to clip their anchors with a chemical. And when you do that, they round up just like that model. This is living cells in a dish. So we then wanted to test whether this is true. And we're talking at the nanometer scale. We had to develop nanotechnologies. And these are now probing technologies. So we wanted to show that the fibers in the cells that are made of actin and myosin like muscle are actually under tension. And so we thought, well, if we were to cut them like a surgeon cuts a muscle, it should pull back. But we're so small, we needed to make a little hole that's nanometer size. So in white here, we're able to visualize in living cells these filaments by using a small molecule called GFP, green fluorescent protein. The Nobel Prize went for this last year or the year before. This is something from an algae that's fluorescent on its own. And you could use genetic engineering to link it to any molecule, and then you could see it in living cells. So each one of these fibers is a bundle of many of these filaments we think contract. And then we take a femtosecond laser, which creates the heat of the sun, but for an incredibly short time, a billionth of a millionth of a second, focused through a microscope lens, so it's only 300 nanometers cubed. And when you focus it on this fiber, you make a 300 nanometer punch hole, and it cuts and it pulls just like a muscle. So this is nano, literally nanosurgery. The cell is perfectly fine. If, if you cut a cell on a flexible substrate, which is like our skin is flexible, most of our tissues are flexible, now you see cutting one makes all the elements rearrange, which is just like what happens in these structures. On the glass substrate where we did before, only one move. But here, it's just like this. And it really is like a bow and a bowstring. Furthermore, there are struts in cells. There are structures, these microtubules. And we could show there are struts because if you take a beating heart cell, we made these microtubules fluorescent, so you see them as white. And now you see they're linear and they're buckle. And this actually helps your heart do its pumping. And finally, they're actually 10 pegs. The cells are not glued to that matrix. They're spot welded in structures called focal adhesions. So cells really do control their shape using tensegrity, which is very much like a spider web or a tent, but on the nanometer scale. But it goes further than this, because one of the most novel properties of living materials in our bodies and in nature is that, as opposed to man-made materials where we use a bulk materials, a hunk of rubber, a hunk of steel, nature builds hierarchically. I know this is true because you could take the nucleus out of one cell, put it into another, and you've just cloned Dolly the sheep. That means the nucleus has its own structure and functional integrity. The cytoplasm also, but you put them together, you get one integrated cell. And we now can use computational models. We use computer science, and we've been able to predict behaviors of many types of cells. At a smaller size scale, the membrane of the cell, the outer covering, is, uses tensegrity in a different way. And because it's arranged in this geodesic arrangement, it's more like this toy. It's called a Hobbesian sphere, which can expand and contract because of the geometry. But interestingly, this is not a tensegrity on its own because it, there's nothing to resist being compressed. It just would fall down. However, if I take one of these and I make it stiff by holding my hand, the whole thing gets stable. Now it is a tensor. And so nature uses this at different size scales, and it goes further. This is a virus. The Nobel Prize 30 years ago, 40 years ago, was showing that all viruses use geodesic architecture. And they actually have a scaffold often at their base that looks just like one of these geodesic dome structures. Furthermore, our bodies are built this way. We're 206 compression-resistant stiff bones that are pulled up against the force of gravity. 
and stabilized by a continuous series of tensile muscles, tendons, and ligaments. And it's the tension or tone in my muscle that makes my arm stiff or, or floppy. And that is tensegrity. And so many years ago, over 10 years ago, I had a Scientific American, if anybody's interested, cover article suggesting that tensegrity is, in fact, the architecture of life. And it's seen at all size scales. This is the eye as a geodesic, an insect. That's a pollen grain. Um, this, these are carbon molecules. And what's exciting about nanotechnology, though, is now we can build at this size scale. And now we can make nano devices that are inspired by, by how nature builds. So with that, I will end. And I'm happy to answer questions. But I think the point is that we're really at a tipping point where we're, we're really beginning to understand enough about how nature does it that we could do it on our own. And we really are going to change the world. So with that, thank you.